Uh, so Tina Stege is a partner in Martina Corporation, a family firm based in the Marshall Islands that draws on local and international expertise to tackle contemporary island issues and climate change, migration, sustainable development, education, and heritage. Tina also serves as educational liaison for the Marshallese Educational Initiative. Uh, it's a nonprofit in, uh, based in Springdale. Um, is that uh, Arkansas? Or in, that's pretty far from the Marshall Islands. <laughs> and that was created to blend scholarly research with practical outreach efforts to create awareness of Marshallese issues on a national stage while also making a real difference in the lives of individual Marshallese. Raised in Majura Atoll, Tina received her BA in Sociology from Princeton University in 1997 and an MA in Anthropology from the University of Aix-en-Provence in 2006. She worked for the RMI Embassy in Washington, D.C. for many years before leaving to focus on independent and community-based projects. She has worked on projects for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, the U.S. Department of the Interior, the RMI government, the Asian Development Bank, and Greenpeace. Tina was instrumental in planning and served as the MC for MEI's Nuclear Remembrance Day in 2014, which was called Reflect Instrument, which uh, I guess it called Reflect, right? Um, reflect, honor, and educate. In 2014 at the Clinton Presidential Library, that's where it was held. Representing civil society and MII, she addressed the General Assembly in the United Nations in September 2015 on the commemoration of the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. Most recently, she partnered with the American Museum of Natural History curator, Dr. Jenny Newell, on a project looking at community-based responses to climate change in the Marshall Islands. So I give you Tina Stege. Yahweh is our greeting in Marshallese. Uh, it is also the word we used to say love. It is the word we used to say goodbye. And it, actually, if you break apart the word, it's ia, which is rainbow. Kwe means to you. It's our way of giving you a symbol of peace, a symbol of love. And so I wanted to begin my talk here today um, and echo what everybody on the panel has said. I really, really struck my heart when Kathy was saying about a culture of peace and that these cultures, these are embedded in our cultures this idea of peace and giving. I'm really honored to be here to share with you the stories of the Marshallese people, my people, and our experiences with nuclear testing. Over 70 years, now, years ago now, the United States government conducted the first of what would be 67 nuclear tests in my country. The impact of those tests, in particular Bravo, um, the Bravo shot that many of you may have heard of, was both violent and immediate. Islanders from Bikini, a word that Americans and people all over the world know, the one Marshallese word that everybody in the world knows, Islanders from Bikini and Inuitak left their ancestral homelands to scrape out an existence in new, often inhospitable environments as a result of that test, those tests. The people of Rongalap and Udruk exposed to near fatal doses of radioactive fallout from the Bravo test, also left their home islands only to be returned prematurely to poisoned environments. For my generation and the generation and others who were born after the testing, the legacy of those 67 tests may not be as direct, but the impact remains as violent and destructive. And this is where I was really responding to what Kathy was saying. Um, some of you probably know this concept um, from Rob Nixon, it's called slow violence. And I feel like it very much applies to the Marshallese people and to all those people who are put in situations of ecological um, disasters that 
go um, over many, many generations, repercussions that over, unfold over decades and centuries. And this is a violence, a slow violence that's often invisible. We, the media latches on to these big events that you know, are bounded in one space and time. But slow violence c captures the violence that media often doesn't, cap doesn't respond to, that doesn't look at how, how things continue to impact people over decades and centuries, long after the bomb itself uh, has been forgotten. But not in my country, we have not forgotten. Although my lineage links me to Woodruff, which is one of the four atolls that the U.S. recognizes as affected by Bravo. Um, and by the way, of the 67 tests, the U.S. only recognizes that one, in fact, uh, affected the health of the people in the Marshall Islands, and that was Bravo. Uh, my formative experiences learning about the testing were as a U.S. college student who came to the United States to research and learn about my own history back in the islands, and then as a newly hired civil servant in the Marshall Islands government who was tasked with gathering oral histories from survivors and working with communities who were still living in exile from their home islands. Those experiences showed me the myriad ways in which Marshallese are affected by this slow violence um, that I talked to you about. Consider the Inuitak people who to this day live next to Runet Dome, which is a cement-capped nuclear waste site built by the United States that does not meet U.S. safety standards for household trash. Or Marshallese men, women, and children with cancers who have no access to treatment because we do not have and never have had an oncologist in the Marshall Islands. It is shameful how limited health care options are for Marshallese people given our history. The Department of Energy provides medical care to people from Rongalap and Utrecht that they recognize as being exposed to fallout from the Bravo test. Everyone else is excluded. This includes people who were resettled on contaminated atolls, this includes people who were never evacuated from other atolls that were affected but not recognized as having been affected. This includes people um, who helped clean up the nuclear waste sites that were left behind by the testing. These people have to go to Hawaii or the mainland United States and as you heard, we have a very large community, for example, in Springdale, Arkansas. They travel to these places to try to get the treatment that they need, only to find that we are labeled legally as non-immigrants, and so disqualify from any federally funded health care programs. Even among those clearly deserving of care, secrecy and obfuscation stands in the way of health and justice. Consider Rangalepi's individuals enrolled without their knowledge in the DOE's Project 4.1, this is um, after the testing had started, which was a biomedical research program that studied the effects of radiation on human beings. One Rangalepi's Jeban Rikalung has said, and I quote, DOE put me in the 4.1 project. It was a guinea pig study of human beings, and now they cannot locate my file. Can somebody at least show me my medical records? On the opposite side of the coin, my experiences also instilled in me a very great pride in the many heroes who made it their life's work to fight for justice and thus rendered the invisibility of this slow violence visible. These are people like Lijan Eknilang, some of you may know, who was a fierce advocate for the people of Rongalep and women throughout the marshals who had been afraid to share the pain of multiple miscarriages and the birth of jellyfish babies. Jellyfish babies is a term that came up, up in our language after the testing because people didn't have any other way to explain what they were seeing. Lijan is known to people around the world for her work but she died from complications of cancer in 2013. There are also people like John Milne, 
a Marshallese who worked on cleanup crews for the U.S. Department of Energy. He founded the Marshall Islands Radiation Victims Association to advocate for care and compensation for his fellow workers. He's hardly known outside of the Marshall Islands, but for me, he was one of the warriors in the fight to make the visible, the invisible visible, and he, he has also passed on. And there are those who continue to work tirelessly to bring Marshley's knowledge and truth about nuclear testing into the light. People like Tony DeBroom, many of you may already know. Um, he's now the RMI's ambassador on climate change, but during his former tenure as foreign minister, a person who's instrumental in bringing the RMI's case against the world's nuclear powers to the international stage. We also have young people like Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, who is a poet. They're using their art and creativity to forge a path towards social justice on nuclear issues and other issues like climate change that are grappling with this slow violence um, concept that I've been raising. And if you haven't heard, heard Kathy's poetry, she's on YouTube. I encourage you to go check out her poems. She has one called Tell Them, which explodes with truth and power about the Marshallese experience. And this year, for the first time ever, our government organized a national conference on the RMI's nuclear legacy. For a long time, when I was growing up, people didn't talk about the nuclear experiences because we didn't know what to say. We didn't have the information. And that has changed. Speakers at this conference included a wide array of people with knowledge of the testing period and its impacts, both Marshallese and non-Marshallese. Called Charting a Journey Toward Justice, the conference was organized around March 1st, which is the anniversary of Bravo, and it's also our Nuclear Victims Remembrance Day in the Marshall Islands, a national holiday. Speaker after speaker spoke to the need for transparency and truth in achieving justice, and at that, Ambassador Tony DeBroom in his keynote actually opened this meeting with the mantra, quote, there can be no closure without full disclosure. Here we are 70 years after the U.S. nuclear testing period ended and we still do not have all the facts. We need to have the information that the United States continues to withhold made public. Only with that can Marshallese make informed decisions on how to move forward. Uh, there was a special, UN Special Rapporteur report that came out in 2012 that advocated, in fact, for releasing all of the records that are still classified related to the testing in order to help the Marshall Islands um, move forward. I'd like to close with um, a quote, a couple of quotes. One is from Apili Haofa, who's a Pacific Island scholar, and his writings have stirred the soul of many islanders. And he said, if we're invisible, we can become dispensable. And another one of my heroes um, is Marshallese health educator and anti-nuclear activist, Darlene K.G. Johnson. She was also a cousin, um, and she's passed away from cancer. And she was instrumental in really blowing this up in the 80s, when nobody wanted to talk about what was happening. And she said, it's very simple, don't be a victim. And so I want to say to you from the bottom of my heart, como tada, thank you for being here to witness our stories. We have to hear these stories. We have to witness these stories that the knowledge lives on. It's a shared humanity. Whenever our shared humanity is diminished, then all of us are diminished. And the slow violence that threatens to harm the people of the Marshall Islands threatens us all. Thank you so much. <laughs>